a landscape of trees massed on little hills, a Roman phalanx marching with the wind into hollows, the woodlands, stockades in circling slated villages, old coal mines, seams as waterlogged as the lungs of those who sweated them, coughing their breathless way into packed churchyards, and two rivers, west, east, silently twisting through plum and sheep country, a muddy way to the sounding channel. There I grew up in my sapling years, wandering freely all seasons, day and night, a solitary, stumbling through foxglove fern or over frosted fields at our light, content with my condition, did not think of any future. But now, gripped by the fever of homesickness, return for a timeless hour or so. The landmarks changed, lose my way, realise I no longer belong here, recognise only a few lined faces, though family names still shout at me. And wonder, this summer humming afternoon, what impelled me to go home? Was it to walk abroad with the dead? Discover again roots that may never have been there? Or the foolishness of age in late rebellion? There are no answers. But brought back with me, almost unaware, a landscape of trees massed on little hills. And there were pools with floating lawns of weed, Shy water voles and fiery dragonflies, fluffed moorhen convoys, beetles on every reed, and anglers eager for a rainbow trout to rise. Fishing for newts or scooping up frog spawn on fleeting April days, I did not see how half my years of gossamer had gone, nor knew I breathed such rare physicity. But cheating time at its own cunning game, I borrow memory's glass and look back now and give each pool its own familiar name, and count the shadows from each bending bough. On that dark pond, remote and sinister, where when I knew her wits all gone was drowned, and autumn morning, the fading of the year, sinking in sullen water without a sound. Why does she haunt me still with vacant face, red bubbled lips and brutish blackened tongue, and lock me out forever from that place, and steal the peace I had when I was young? Was I deceived by all those fragile days, and mocked by voices which I thought I heard? Or is it only age that in the end betrays, and cracks the glass, and makes the vision blurred? Almost no history, the town bleak, bare, little more than the jigsaw of small houses, shops, grey chapels, and churches sprawled a monstrous fossil across a westward-looking hillside, marshland clog in the valleys, summer scorched, winter biting hard. It was hacked out of moor and old forest. You could explore it in an hour. Little beauty of itself, though cottage gardens blazed, midsummer sunsets flooded the long slopes, and a new architecture flowered when snow came. Only its setting gave distinction with house rising upon house to dramatic skies. Poverty walked the roads with me, the naked years of depression salting the air. The fortunate escaped. But always the comforting sight of trees, oaks and beeches, whichever way you turned, half hiding tall chimney shafts and tips, and beyond them far mountain ridges, keeping their alien secrets to themselves. At the top of the town, where the wind always blew fresh and free, a great panorama, the bold river sparkling through red meadows and farms, the white cathedral tower commanding, belonging its scene to another country. The river still curves to the sea, the woodlands throb with song, but the town has changed, more prosperous, cosmetic, almost like any other town. I remember its drabness, but also its pride, and faces of the colliers have all been washed white, and something fierce and passionate gone. My hope is I am given the last sight of it all, skies, fields, riverbank and glade, before I am finally tidied up for the night. When all the houses in the town have shut their eyes and gone to sleep, on silent feet invaders come, 
and roads go white with lawless sheep. Sly trespassers from forest verge, they straggle freely as they will, up weedy paths, down narrow lanes, raid garden plots to eat their fill. Of every plant new growing there, munching away at tenderest tops, and trample down with devil's feet the choicest of the season's crops. But when the languid town wakes up to curse of pavements fouled with mess, the thieves have left, and summer arse are lost in blithe forgetfulness. And passing by the crumbling church, where sleep the living with the dead, I saw upon its notice board the well-known text which simply said, All we like sheep have gone astray, and turned each one to his own way. It was the warm smell of honeysuckle I best remember, spicing the quick hedgerows, the dog roses, pink and white tangles, stems intertwined, they hid blackbirds' nests. Their fragrance and dazzle are with me now, as early morning I explore another in landscape, with rambling arches of honeysuckle and dog roses. But this is not my country, it does not speak a familiar language. And she who once lingered with me, halting at the far stile to take breath, long dead to summer's songs, is walking to another country. Supper over, autumn evenings after church, they gathered around the piano. Family photographs, seaside souvenirs, tottering those grey aunts, uncles, friends and neighbours, leaving the table to its pickles and cold meats. He sang the old hymns of childhood again and again, yellowing trees outside keeping time. I see them now in their Sunday finery, long skirts, high collars, velveteen frocks, the black bonneted widow sadly sipping their beer, the boy who turned over the music pages, and here, as I heard then, the bird country voices filling every room in the house. They are long dead, those fervent singers, all gathered at the river, lie silent, almost forgotten, in the rain-battered churchyard. I live on, my green hills far away, and remember the tunes loud sounding. Lamplight falling on soft lips, bearded faces, they are in their small corner, and I in mine. The fringing trees of the villages, older than the drab houses, the turf far older than the trees, the red earth beneath hides history, fossil, bone, coin and shard. The rough British tracks crisscrossing the forest lie buried under Roman roads, a jumble of smashed Silurian skull, stone axe, Danish drinking cup. Saxon meadows are one with their cows and buttercups. Norman cider orchards squashed together, dead to the cry of King's hunting horn. The past lives on with the concrete present, nothing destroyed, the layered centuries preserve all. Everything exists forever out of sight and sound, waiting to be lifted into the light. Walk in the moss acres of this woodland, I hear an underground stream, straining to break out from drowned marshes, bringing an old voice with it, and see its first brown trickle begin to glint like new silver as it dribbles through tall ferny banks that once were hedges. Almost hidden by trees in a fold of the sheep-dotted hills, a field like the field of the cloth of gold, with peaceful armies of wild daffodils, their banners blowing over the blood-red mould, flooding it with visionary light that fills my eyes as I remember that long-ago morning in spring I saw them first and sang at their welcoming. And I wonder which is the more real, the sight I first had of them that crisp March day, before time's fog slowly began to steal the bright memory of them away, or the bunch I hold now, and which I feel warm in my hand, are seeming to say, we are the same flowers you found, and picked them, and now on your home ground. It was an orchard of plum trees, massed on a turfed hillside, where rabbits and sheep ran. You came to it from a chestnut wood, along the carter's wheel-scored track, to another part of the forest. Those trees heaved in the springtime skies, heavy with blossom and bees, a backcloth of white magnificence, and, at picking time, such mellowness. With propped-up branches, loaded long ladders reaching up to the sun, 
round flannel-shirted men dressed for the occasion, very gently placing the warm fruit into wide baskets as if they were newly laid eggs. No orchard now, as I come this way again, a day in winter, frost gripping the track, and the old plum pickers packed away in their churchyard boxes. The hillside is a new world, brick cottages where the orchard once was, television aerials, metal road, cars parked at every gate, small formal gardens. But no regret, no foolish grieving for what is gone. It did not always glow in its own time. There is only a change of scene and a different play being acted out. But the roots of the trees still deep in me and remembering white flowers, I come to my picking time. From her I heard how he was born and preached the living word in little towns to country boys like me and why he died on Calvary. Before I was seven, had taught me all I need to know of heaven and prayers enough to guard me well and keep me from the fires of hell. I passed by the homestead, but they were not there, nor she who bore them. Other faces looked out, I did not know them. I passed by the churchyard, and one son was there with her who bore him. The headstone a ruin, I could just read it. And two sons not there, in their ashes aparted from her who bore them, the family all scattered. I am walking elsewhere. As we once walked together, my three elder brothers, with her who loved us, through the echoing valleys, and me lagging behind. When the nights drew in, they quietly came back, the gypsies, to their old camping ground, a coppice on the edge of the complacent town. Smoke from the slow fires circling around, patch-covered wagons, tents black and brown, into the larches and across the railway track. They kept to themselves in that one spot. Only the midwife or the policeman ever came to see them, squatting around each simmering pot, or whittling wood for making toys and pegs, with tattered children at some secret game, or dancing like maenads through the leaves, thin-faced, bare feet and legs. They could not read and never went to school. The town declared they were all rogues and thieves who did not work or follow any rule, but could tell fortunes by looking at your hand, cure coughs and colds, cast spells. I went to see them once as to a foreign land, not thinking they might spirit me away. And there with them and their sweet woody smells, I stayed in trance for more than half the day. They laughed out loud and gave me rabbit stew, told many a daring Romany tale. A young girl sang a song of travelling. A crippled man spoke of his years in jail and what to do with silver when the moon is new. No gypsy camp there now, the copses felled. The ones I met I never saw again. And I have wandered far uncertainly, but often feel that I have been expelled from all the freedom of the sun and rain once given to me by that blithe company. Those clump trees on the spur of the hill hide an Iron Age fort. Blackened bones have been found there, bearing the marks of fire. Few ever ventured there, for all the span of the countryside laid out below. Fields, orchards, farms, the spires of churches, the river glinting, blue peaks on this skyline. But its isolation called me many times. It was trapped there once, a twilight of violent wind and storm, and heard, as I crouched in fear, what I knew in a nightmare moment to be the pagan voices of ancient gods, once worshipped in this sacrificial place, and not yet brought to quiet, the avenging spirits of rivers and hills, the lord of thunder, gods of wind and rain, dark rulers of earth, water. They followed me beneath the flashing heavens, as I lurched back over the sodden meadows, tormented by the echoing unison, where shall we bury him? Where shall we bury him? In earth or water? In earth or water? And answered them, choose where and how you will. Bury me in a ditch by the flowering wayside. Scatter my ashes at low tide on the river. Let me rest under the broad tree in the forest. 
raise a simple mound over me in the churchyard. They are silent now, those menacing voices, and do not speak to me this cold autumn morning, the stars receding at the sun's rising, as, at peace, I look up to the spur of the hill and see through spidered mist those trees brooding. She went out to all weathers, night and day, that country midwife, the huge warm bulk of her, walking the miles through fog and slush, or sweating along thorned lanes in dusty summer, to valley cottages, mouldering and rain racked, knowing what had to be done at the end. Beneath candlelight, flickering, floor creaking, water boiling on the hob, mother and midwife labouring, the man not knowing where to go. Then, after agony and tears, the comfort of a firm hand, a baby born, safely delivered, the long wait over, a mug of cider to wet the new head. Now to return, the same way she came, over four fields, half a dozen stiles, the long pull up hill in the half light, calm as attending stars, she makes another entry in her book, puts away the black bag, serenely satisfied. And did the meadows sing the Beatitudes as she passed? Conduits of may blossom flow over the murmuring hedges. Trout in winter, lying embalmed in frozen pools, waked the sound of a cry. Every lane break into fire, knowing the milk would come. And hooters from every pit salute her with midnight hallelujahs. She would not believe such fancy, but rising early, get everything tidy and ready for the next visitation and the sight of a baby suckling. Drowsed by the afternoon sun, I lie dreaming in corn, barley blades fencing me in, heavy needle heads bending. I'd eased myself, remember this place, fifty burnished Septembers ago. The clacking of the old threshing machine going round and round the baked meadow, terrified rabbits running madly to cover at the sudden flash of a gun, and long days when nobody came. I enjoyed this place for what it was, with its golden abundance and a comforting sight of other fields, glimpsed through barley stalks, dropping gently downhill to the broad river, the unclouded sky arching overhead, as I enjoy it still at this moment, the abiding sun stroking my limbs. I had no cares then and have none now, but only calm contemplation of dead days, Faces of friends already come to their harvest, happenings that have grown small, insignificant, that once loomed like mountains, and speculation too about myself, musing here, not yet ready for the dark reaper. I was content with my condition, alone in the kingdom of corn. But yet I do not seem to be alone. Voices and rustlings invade, as if warning me I am an alien usurping territory I thought my own. Or was his hollow only a brief lodging place, a few unclocked hours deceiving, and now and then a single dream pressed between the leaves of intervening years, which began in a dimming past, and continuing here, will not end until the bell solemnly tolls over this ripening meadow, and my harvest silently gathered in. Time for the scattering of last seeds, foxglove and hollyhock, and with a sigh to blow gently away this dandelion clock. The moment come to brush away the dew from cold morning hands, the tide to fill footprints with foam on night-chilled sand, and from that yellowing line of elms a few thin leaves to fall, the slow worm to glide from the sunny bank to the garden wall. Time to read the blurred words on the page that will finish the book, and then, with no more to do or say, creep into the ingle nook. A final look at this intimate land, with farewells to be said, and the slow putting out of the light before going to bed. <laughs>